Okay. Okay, the board should be there in a few moments. Uh, good evening, all. So this week, uh, I'd like to look at some more interesting games of Judith Polgar, uh, the strongest woman player ever. This is back in Lenora's now, 1997. And there's some very detailed involved games that I'd like to go over, actually. Um, the first game I'd like to show you is her game against Predrag Nikolic. So let's have a look at this game. I hope the board is okay. It looks okay. So E4 from Judith. She was primarily, is primarily an E4 player. She's come back recently um, after a few years away from the game. So um, the French defense from Nikolic. Judith plays D4 and now the winner variation, Knight C3. After Bishop B4, E5. And usually black plays c5 here, but we have a little bit of a rarer move. Knight c7, but still very popular. Uh, actually, what does live book say here? If I access the live book, it's the second most popular move actually to c5. Then there's b6, third most popular. Okay, so knight e7. Um, and white now kicks the bishop, it takes on c3, so theoretical c5. Queen g4, trying to exploit the g7 pawn. And black uh, usually actually castles here. Uh, there's also queen c7 as a move, but this this is the third most popular, just king f8. And here we see bishop d2, that is the most common move actually played. Queen c7. And most games now have bishop d3. I've got there's 50 games in live but with bishop d3. Judith actually played rook c1, and we're kind of out of book uh, now. Out well, nearly out of book. It's quite rare this move. Rook c1. Uh, it involves quite a radical idea already. Then after queen a5, Judith is preparing uh, just to sacrifice. The a pawn. And you might think, is there enough pressure here on this this line? Can the rook really come out aggressively, or you know, can can white use this f file basically, and use the extra time that black's going to use to gain that pawn? So we're in for a very dramatic game already. The scene is set with this rook c1. That white is just going to ignore this queenside pawn, and of course, then that makes the a pawn quite dangerous. It's already got the rook behind it, ready to roll. So we see h4. This rook can come in like this. But uh, what about this a pawn and taking here? Queen takes a, a3, h5. The rook doesn't come in just yet. White prevents h5 from black, which might have been useful. But also h6 might be on the cards here as a dangerous threat to parry. Black plays h6. Now the rook swings in. With rook h3. It doesn't look as though there's an immediate tactical target because only rook f3, the bishop's holding together e6. It's just this knight, if that can be dangerous, maybe to attack e6 soon after. So let's see. c4 from black just closing the queen side, taking away the d3 square from the bishop. Rook f3. Now knight bc6 is played. There's no immediate threat here. And a curious move in this position. Uh, actually, let's let's add a bit uh, here. Uh, black, you know, looks to be able to just move the queen away and, and use the pawn soon. Uh, rook f4 doesn't seem to immediately threaten anything significant, but what it does is give the f3 square for the queen to double on f7. If white had played queen f4 on f7 just like that, then knight d8 looks okay. So reshuffle here, rook f4, and now queen f3 on f7. Knight d8. 
So how can white proceed? There's a bit of a time limit to this attack because these pawns are going to be coming down. This a pawn in particular looks pretty dangerous. But there is a structure here to undermine with g4, g5. And this is played g4. And already, you know, it looks a little bit as though um, you know, this, this is a cause for concern. But uh, we see the king moving to e8. For the moment, g5 is not on the cards, but knight h3 accentuates the possibility now uh, of g5 at some point soon. As soon as g5 is played, though, the f5 square becomes available to black. So it might not even be the main main thing right now. Um, or is it? Black actually played rook b8. And in fact here, black is first thing just to carry on just with the queen side. Uh, and if b4, we've got this, this kind of pressure on, along the third rank. So we'll try and get rid of the queens and just use the extra pawn. White does play now g5. And now black does use that f5 square, which seems like a fairly solid defense for the moment. Or is it? Um, the engine suggestion here is already that actually rook takes f5 might be quite interesting for white. For example, rook takes f5. G takes. And if G takes knight f4, and actually we've got d5 to play with. So this would be some compensation for white already, actually. But uh, Judith didn't go for that immediately. She played bishop g2. And we have a5. G takes h6, knight takes h6. So the chance has been missed to sacrifice the exchange there. And black again looks as though, is, is there a big problem here? Well, queen g3, I think g7. The king goes to protect that. And now rook f3, so at least b4 is prepared against. White can just attack the queen on b4 now. This doesn't work. It wasn't played, just c takes. Well, it's a, it's a nuisance for black, which is not needed. Just attacking the queen like that. So, okay, bit of prophylaxis. Knight c6. Now knight g5. Actually, t technically, black's doing okay in this particular position, it seems. In fact, it seems as though black might have had a strong blockade idea with knight, knight e7. Uh, with the idea that knight e f5, that looks like a good control of f5. I think um, some credit to Nicolik here. He's kind of chosen a very closed strategic opening favored by the likes in the past of Mikhail Bovring against a very tactical dynamic player. The style of is, is very towel like. So this is this is a very interesting choice of opening to try and keep solid with here. Um, rook b7 was played. And now bishop h3. So there's a tangible threat of bishop takes e6 because of this pin. Knight d8. We see queen g1. Mysterious stuff going on. But if the king moves, we've got connection here. We might be able to kick the queen, for example. Knight g8. Bishop g4. So this also, is, it looks good to protect the pawn, but also maybe a battery later against the e6. Queen b2. The knight drops back. And the knight heading to f4 would mean knight g6 might be on the cards. b4, knight f4. So knight g6 is now on the cards. Black parries that. Bishop drops back. And this means that also queen things like queen g5 um, or king e2 could be dangerous on that g file again. But black is getting some progress here on the queen side, b3. Now Judith plays king e2. And apparently quite good here technically with just queen a2. Black, black should, might, well, might be okay. But black actually played a4. 
and now things sharpen up. Knight g6 check. Knight takes. Queen takes g6. And White is now threatening h6 all of a sudden. This this is good pressure for h6. Although things are coming to a tension point here on the queen side. Queen a3. For the first time now, White, at least from an engine perspective, is, is actually doing well here, and it looks dangerous to play h6. We have rook takes h6, bishop takes, g takes, and now possibly this this is a very good move as well. But queen f6 was played, threatening uh, queen takes d8. The king moves. Rook g1 still a lot of threats here now, and we're approaching move 40. So maybe black was short of time. Queen f8, and this is an absolutely comical thing that happened here. I just couldn't believe this. This is in the Norris tournament of 1997. I don't know if any of you have seen this game, but uh, this is just amazing what's about to happen. C takes b3, C takes, and the king goes to d2. The king has an intention to try and stop. These pawns, believe it or not, this is just incredible. B2, King C2, so the king is already stopping B1. And even more outrageously now, after A3, King B1, believe it or not, stopping A2. The king's on the light square, a little bit away from the queen on a dark square. So white maintains the pressure with all the pieces, and the king does the blockading job of these queenside pawns. And I find this position remarkable that this happened. I don't know how many of you have seen this game before. I just find this absolutely remarkable. I've not seen this sort of thing before with the king heading to do the job on the queen side. Isn't the king in mortal danger doing this though? Actually, from an engine point of view, that there is a move which apparently is very good for black, bishop d7. Uh, for example, well, the threat is bishop b5 and maybe coming here for a2. This wasn't played though, so the opponent maybe let Juliet off here. So a2 check was played. And why just snap this off? Rook a7 check. Is this gambling or has black calculated this to mate? King takes b2, wiping out the dangerous pawns. Check. Check. The king goes to d3. It looks really quite dangerous, but where is the mate? Queen c4 check. The king just goes to e3, offering the c3 pawn. Queen takes c3 check, king f4. Unbelievable. I thought. Believe it or not, no one has commented on this game at ChessGames.com. I couldn't believe my eyes. I think what's happened is, in this tournament, there was the classic game against Kasparov uh, with the touch move controversy, and people have not checked out these other games. This is unbelievable what has just happened here. I have not seen it in any other game of chess ever. The king being used like this, taking out the dangerous pawns, and then heading back to the king side. White is technically better from an engine perspective here. Queen takes d4 check, king g3. The king is now safe and white has her own threats like check and the rooks can, can actually use that c file here. Rook e7 is played. Bishop f1. Bishop b5 is introduced. Queen b2. Bishop d3 now. Rook b1 is introduced with bishop d3 to try and pin some pieces. Knight c6. It looks as though e5 is a bit of a problem. White protects that. Still maintaining uh, some dangerous things like rook b1. d4. The rook got, drops back to f3 now, knowing that this is blocked, so that's not a problem. Queen b8 hitting it again. The rook comes to protect. 
White maintains a dominating position here. White is the exchange up as well. So, okay, a pawn down, but the exchange up. King d7, king h3. Queen b4, hitting the rook. The rook moves. Threatening now, things like, well, bishop e4 could target c6. The queen for the moment is protecting e7, so there's no there's no threat at the moment at rook c6, although the queen has to be careful to keep an eye on e7. Queen e4. And then we see bishop e4. So black's pieces uh, are under great scrutiny now all of a sudden. Bishop b7. Rook d3. Queen a7. And now putting more pressure on d4 with rook c4. So white is threatening to just take here and then take this pawn, valuable centre pawn, and open up this d-file. Queen a1. And white does that now. Bishop takes c6, eliminating the d-pawn defender. Rook d takes d4. Check is used. And here, black resigned. Let's have a look why black resigned. Well, it looks pretty diabolical. If king e8, then queen h8 is mate. If bishop d5, then rook takes d5 here. E takes queen d6 is forcing mate. What a fantastic game! It might not be the soundest game ever, but I've not seen anything like it. I don't know about you guys, but this king was just um, heroic earlier. If we just look at what the king did, it's a remarkable thing. It just went and took out the pawns. Maybe black got overexcited and came back. Unbelievable. What do you guys think of that first game? Very prestigious tournaments, the kind of Wimbledon of chess, the Norris tournaments, 1997. And there's another classic game I'd like to show you now against Vasily Ivanchuk. So Judith playing, playing with the black pieces. D4, Ivanchuk plays D4, knight f6, c4, g6. Now knight f3, bishop g7, g3, black castles, bishop g2. And now instead of playing d6, which is kind of King's Engine Finchetta variation, she plays d5, more like Grunfeld style, white castles. We see knight c6. This is, a, I think this is unusual. Let's check the live book. Usually c6. It's a bit solid and dull, dare I say. D takes c4, but knight c6 looks quite interesting. It's the third most popular move. 206 games. The others are more than like 1,400 each. So knight c6. White plays now. I think a theoretical inaccuracy. Usually white plays c takes d5 here. There's 107 games in live book. Or knight bd2, 66, knight e5. This has all been played before. 20 with knight a3, but Vasily plays knight c3. It's a bit unusual, going quite heavily out of book. You might wonder why. Well, d takes c4. Um, here, you know, there's a problem for white, actually. Uh, white plays d5, and now we see knight b4. The d5 pawn is loose, and how does white actually protect it here? White plays e4, and um, okay. Now we see e6, and black actually is doing very well out of this opening. It's not just the act of nabbing the pawn. The center is really under fire here. Vasily plays bishop g5, as, as though he's got things under control. h6, bishop e3. OK, for the moment, uh, there's an issue now with bishop c5. Why it might be threatening bishop c5 if e takes d. And that would be quite a nuisance. 
but now knight d3 is played so that covers actually the c5 square as well and this d5 pawn is still under pressure white takes it and black is actually a solid pawn up here with a nice knight on d3 when i say a solid pawn up though it is it is double pawns but uh, b2 is under fire at the moment white actually just plays h3 though and it looks as though maybe taking on b2 is, is slightly risky uh judith actually plays queen d7 which might actually be a, a much better move technically just hitting h3 uh if the king if the king tries to protect h3 then knight takes b2 here i think this looks quite tasty so queen b1 we can actually target c3 with check now that the king is on h2 that was the point because now knight g4 with check is great for black so this is why this is very good actually to try and get the king to come here for this diagonal white plays queen d2 in this position is actually quite a bad position in fact and you know it's bad if the engine is actually suggesting that's the best move queen d2 is played just offering the h3 pawn so bishop takes h3 but white gets the h6 pawn so okay maybe you know if white can somehow exploit the downside of the knight on d3 this this might be something but for the moment it looks like a great position for black and in fact after rook a e8 white now has to worry about the e4 pawn Wesley takes on g7 king takes now knight g5 this bishop is asked to go away or take on g2 it takes on g2 king takes now really a uh, fantastic move knight h5 is played uh, with huge frets actually white is in big trouble after queen e3 can you see what black plays in this position which effectively ends the game it causes Vesely Imanchuk to resign what would you play here with black any ideas if I give you 20 seconds starting from now So black's play. Any ideas? Okay, I'm going to show you. Okay, I'm going to show you. Knight, it's a knight move knight d f4 check fantastic move um, now this is really diabolical actually if g takes then queen g4 check and we we cut out the g3 square for queen g3 uh, where does the white king go here if king h1 then rook h8 we're threatening a double check here this is, this is just horrendous if knight h3 then knight takes f4 is absolutely crushing the h file is being used by black here it's murderous and you might think well okay what about king f3 here f6 is nice so we don't really want to take here because this is horrendous on f4 and there's not much else to do though if where, where can the knight go it's actually stranded here uh, so that's pretty horrendous the king can't move with this knight on f4 so it's just it's just horrible so it's a bit of a disaster just 22 moves that's the image was taken out in this game no less than that 21 
no, actually it was less than 20 moves. <laughs> Knight D F4 check. So I've just appended some moves. Knight D F4 check, a crushing blow here. If King H2, I think, well, we, we still get, the, you know, they use the H file. It doesn't help. Or well, King G1, Queen G4 is apparently, it's, it's one of the more accurate moves here. And with Rook H8 to follow, uh, for example, Rook A E one here. Well, we we can actually just take the knight anyway. We're on the knight as well. Where is the knight going in this position? If Knight F three, let's try and preserve the knight. Then Knight takes G three, and again, this this H file is is just totally murder murderous. Or, or just Queen G two. So Vasily Ivanchuk take Ivanchuk taken out. I think. Theoretically, people were saying after this game that um, actually knight c3 might have been an early blunder. <laughs> Unbelievable, but this this is actually a critical mistake. It seems uh, a little bit theoretically. Um, well, black slightly slightly better. Just taking here slightly better. It's not majorly a mistake. It's I think the follow up didn't help. Um, maybe e4 e4 was better. And this, this is, um, yeah, it's it's a game. Okay, so let's have a look at another game. So this time against Alexei Dreyev, and Judith was playing white. So I'm going to flip the board. So e4 again. We see a Sicilian defense, knight f3, knight c6, and it's uh, Sveshnikov time, knight f6, knight c3, or is it black would play e5 for a Sveshnikov? No, d6 back into normal Sicilian, bishop g5, e6, white plays now queen d2, a6, white now castles queenside. And um, I think this is very theoretical. Bishop d7 is the top move played here. f4, b5, very theoretical. White usually takes on f6 in this position, but Judith played knight takes, which is another popular move. And now bishop d3, supporting the e4 pawn. Bishop e7. And now e5. D takes, F takes, knight d5. White now takes on e7, queen takes e7, and now uses the weakened dark squares. So with knight e4. So we're kind of out of book mostly now. So let's have a look at this position. Black usually castles. That's the only move really, I think. The main move anyway. So um, here, Okay, after rook hf1, white does have a nice position. And it looks a little bit scary actually for, for an immediate knight f6 in this position. Uh, black parries that with f5. And it's a structural concession for king safety. Um, if if we saw if we saw for example rook a c eight, I mean this is actually um, very tempting knight f6. For example, like this, this is dangerous. Queen h6, f5. This this is slightly dangerous for black, but anyway, it was it was avoided. Okay, so black makes that structural concession, plays f5. We have e takes f6, knight takes f6. So something is up structurally that you don't usually have an isolated e6 pawn like this. Knight takes f6. Rook takes, and just simplification here for a moment. Rook takes, queen takes, rook f1. So it looks a bit like Vishianan's recent game uh, that he took a slight advantage into victory recently in the candidates. Can white actually use the superior pawn structure here? Black has that those free pawn islands. Is e5 going to be a good blockade square here? Uh, rook. 
Okay, so rook f1, queen e7, queen e3, already eyeing some dark squares. Well, e5 looks like a logical blockade square. Uh, but this, this bishop's eyeing g2 as well here. Bishop g2 at the moment, I don't think quite um, is, is good. Rook g1. And queen a3, this is, this is just dangerous. It's too dangerous to allow this. It's shielding black's king, in effect. You don't really want to take a pawn in front of your king. Black plays rook d8. And now the pawn has actually moved to g3, or out of the way of that. Bishop d5. a3, protecting that a2 pawn. Queen d6. Rook d1. So now bishop e4 is on the cards to use that pin. Queen c6. Queen f4. And actually there's a naughty little tactic here being threatened in this position after queen f4. I wonder, um, well, I'll just show you. The naughty little tactic is actually to take here and then play queen h4 check on that loose rook. So black has to parry that. He moves the rook so oh, out of harm's way. Rook e1, queen c5. There's a bit of manoeuvring here. Queen h4 on h7, h6, creating some light square weaknesses. Queen h5, pinning the bishop, attacking the rook. The rook moves. Queen e5. So this is an ideal blockade square in front of the isolated pawn. a5. And now white doesn't mind exchanging off queens. Queen e3. Because actually a5 did loosen the b5 pawn a bit, so white's gaining at least one tempo. The queens do get exchanged off, and the pawn's a bit loose. b4, white takes, a takes, b3, fixing that b pawn. So can white actually win this position technically, based on superior pawn structure? And what about black's activity on the f-file? That's going to be tested here, rook f2. Rook e2. The king could run rampant in this ending if the rooks got exchanged off. Could come up here, and this b pawn is a target. The rook is preserved. Rook f3. Bishop e4. Check. King d2. The black king comes in. King f7. Now, bishop takes d5. E takes, and king d3. The king is still quite aggressive, threatening king d4. If it gets to c5, that would be really dangerous. So black stops that. Rook d1 check. Rook d2. Now rook e1. After king d4, king e6. There's still a problem here. This b4 pawn, king c5. White stands better. White is going to win a pawn here, it seems. Rook e4. Winning the first pawn. But now rook e2. Can black actually try and get a pass pawn going here if black can win a pawn? Well, actually, here, precise move, played rook h5, preserving that and just dropping that one instead. This b pawn will be enough if we can just take this one. Check. Taking the pawn. King takes b4. So the outside pass pawn scenario has been reached. These rook and pawn endings are really crucial to know about. So, can white win with this? King f6. This might not have actually been the most accurate move. Uh, but uh, let's go with it. Rook h4. King g5. Now, h3. Away from the glare of the rook. Rook h2. Check. Now, h4. So these pawns look a bit more solid than before. Rook h3. And it looks as though g5 could be a nuisance to this rook. We have check, king e5. Now rook f3. So that g5 is less of a nuisance now. King e4. And now the rook goes to c3. So these pawns totally intact. This pawn is just ready and waiting. King d4. Check. And now here is the point where white, to try and make pro progress, does something radical. 
king c5 sacking the g pawn the b pawn is ready to run rook takes b4 g5 black tries to get the pass pawn going here b5 this one's pretty quick the king has the opposition this is absolutely crucial often in these end games to keep the opposition just to stop the black king being a, a big nuisance to keep the opposition in. king f5 b6 rook d3 b7 rook d8 king b6 rook b8 king is winning that rook now or is it in this position actually a technically strong move would be h5 if Judith plays b h she didn't and this, this is a very important position actually the engine is just h5 Maybe I shouldn't have said that but um, let's have a look at b8 this is just the draw actually apparently g takes h4 and this is, this is drawing if we take this h5 and the king's too far away it seems the engine has it as a draw anyway so Julian, it has to be careful not to blow this position with b8 here so here this is crucial b8 is not to be played h5 should be considered she actually plays king b6 and this doesn't lose the advantage actually uh, for the moment uh, the king you have to bear in mind the king's quite quick to get back across the board across the diagonal potentially and white now threatens rook c8 with a faster king to, to rescue against uh, these pawns so rook b8 now and now h5 is played and that does slow down any ambitions of these two pawns g4 and this requires some precise calculation rook c8 and this is this is actually much better than before rook takes b7 king takes king g5 so the reason rook c5 check we're keeping this pawn king h4 and the king is doing well here with king c6 g3 and either king d5 or king d6 is actually still very good so it plays king d6 and now g2 rook c1 is played and black resigns this position this king is just much nearer if black played king g3 here king e5 and there's no time the king the king's getting back for this pawn we can give up the rook so actually it's a very important um thing here then uh, to bear in mind if, if you've got a, a rook and pawn ending if we go back yeah it just seems so tempting we win this pawn we take our pawn all the way up there but uh, at the last moment this this is actually amazing that this position b8 is to be avoided it's amazing isn't it some of these rook and pawn endings how you can just mess up i mean so here h5 is good or king b6 just keeping the king around if any g takes h here we have rook c8 and that's pretty quick so black needs to um play this rook b8 and then we play the h5 and it's just a pain uh trying to get this pawn uh we win that rook so as the game we, we win the rook and getting this pawn is a such a pain 
but it's not going to happen. And then the king gets time to go back, just waiting for this one to drop, this one away, and then we get that one. It's quite a technique to it. It's quite an amazing technique. Uh, it just shows, yeah, a controlled game. She didn't mind simplifying uh, technically. Something to bear in mind is rook and pawn in these, how far your king's away. Okay, um, another game I'd like to show you is against um, Jerome Piquet. Well, I think went to work for, for a Dutch billionaire after he was, at this time he was a very active player. He went to work for Ustrum, I think, who was a correspondence chess world champion, Jerome Piquet. In this game, he played d4 against Judith, knight f6, c4, g6. And Judith actually doesn't play the king's engine defense, but the ground field. Actually, this is, I think this is an interesting point that there's a lot of king's engine players that might not try the ground field, but it's a, it's a close relative. Uh, I know it's a different style of game though, uh, but, um, and it's very theoretical, I think. So knight f3, bishop g7, queen b3. This is the Russian system, queen b3. D takes, queen takes. Castles, let's have a look at live book here. This is all mainline stuff, e4. a6 is theoretical. e5, b5, preparing an accelerated fianchetto sometimes. Queen b3, knight fd7. And usually white plays e6 now, according to live book, most of the time e6 is played. We see in this game bishop e3, c5, and now e6 here. Judith in this game played c4. Usually also c takes is popular. c4, e takes f7, rook takes f7, queen drops back, knight b6. So it seems black has some light square pressure here on this diagonal, but um, we're mostly out of book here. So knight e5. The rook drops back. And now white has a go at this structure with a4. Has a takes a swipe at it. Very interesting concept now, in fact. Very interesting here. What does black want to do? If black wants to try and um not lose b5 or something and plays b4. This is not very pleasant, I think. Knight e4. And then with a5 to follow, c4 looks loose. This just looks horrible in some respects. What Judith did is actually for maximum peace play, she plays bishop b7. After a takes, a takes, okay. Rook takes, bishop takes, first pawn sack, one pawn down. Knight eight d seven. Another pawn bites the dust. So what what is there with the two pawns? Well, White's king hasn't castled. There's pressure scrutiny on the king side here. So the, for the two pawns, there's actually actually the Houdini li quite likes actually black here. Unbelievably, I mean, this is 1997, and actually Houdini's evaluation is is dropping down and down here at just 0 0.37 for white. <laughs> Believe it or not, so this whole concept of the double pawn sack isn't that unsound. It seems there's a lot of play here. Black plays king h8, getting out of the way on this diagonal. White plays h4 as though there's, a, there's crude intentions. But <laughs> uh, there's a nifty uh, tactic here. Well, the bishop is kind of overloaded here on c4 and, and g2. If, if white tried to avoid this overloading, just before we go into that, if knight takes b6, Knight takes uh, with knight d5 to follow. It looks a bit scary for white. Okay, so we see this h4, and uh, 
now a stunning little tactic bishop takes g2 so on that c4 so gaining one pawn back but helping white castle though that's the downside to it so after castling okay at least it's only one pawn down and these, these pawns are fractured queen b8 the dark squares are weakened this looks a bit weak knight c3 knight f6 it's um it's still a very active position for black um bishop c1 I don't think white um I don't think knight takes b2 is on here actually knight takes b2 queen e2 that's that's pretty nice so forget trying to get the other pawn back uh, another pawn back the knight just drops back much better is just to try and exploit the king side d5 knight f5 so h4 being looked at now queen a4 protecting like that knight h5 and with this this bishop now can come in the game quite aggressively knight e2 okay so while bishop e5 there might be i think there might be no this might be okay as well but black actually chooses um bishop f6 looking at the h pawn again there's only the queen protecting the h pawn bishop g5 now this is quite safe to take the pawn with the queen so gains both pawns back can she actually get an advantage now to getting the two pawns back the engine is like black here bishop f3 and we see knight hg7 so if black's going to take and then we queen d2 after this would be a vulnerable pawn queen e4 knight d6 hitting the queen queen g4 in this position maybe h5 was a nice move because we've got a nice blockade on f5 but knight g f5 was played it's also a nice move as well though and um doesn't lose back any of the advantage Black has got a definite advantage here. I think white structure has just been um, compromised a bit, and um, black's piece play looks quite good. Knight f4. Knight f7. Now knight e5 is a juicy fork coming up, potentially. Because uh, any queen g2 we can just take here, and then knight h4. Uh, so this is dangerous knight e5 right here bishop e4 and it's still dangerous and it is played knight e5 hitting the queen a little bit queen drops to h3 knight d4 and now black is threatening to just take and be on on the on the night white plays bishop h6 bishop g7 bishop drops back now queen b4 so slightly improving the position these, these are slightly loose pieces here queen e3 h6 and this is actually a brilliant move pardon me h6 is actually a brilliant move because uh, the queen is actually holding e7 the bishop's kind of been trapped here after h6 wow so actually sorry just rewind here this was actually a blunder queen e3 was a definite blunder in this game uh, with this h6 now is trapping the bishop ouch uh, knight takes g6 knight takes so white is a piece down now bishop takes and there's a neat little tactic here knight f4 is played uh, because if bishop takes f4 rook we can play rook takes f4 because uh, if queen takes we've got knight e2 check 
So a neat little tactic to preserve being a piece up. So white plays bishop takes g7, king takes. Now king h1, as though the g file might be a bit dangerous. Black has to stop this. She plays actually knight d e2, controlling that g1 square. Bishop f3. But now, knight g6, and the queen is going to come across. Bishop takes e2. Okay, giving the piece back, but uh, queen takes h4. White's king is dangerously placed after rook h8. Oh dear. Queen c3 check, king f7. Queen f3 check, and the checks are running out here, knight f4. And now it's a forced mate for white. Yeah, it's a bit of a grueling tactical game. But white has to resign here now. Um, can't defend like queen g3. We just uh, play queen h1, mate. Uh, there's no defense here. Yeah, these, these were quite involved long games, but I think um, I think they're historically important because I think this is one of the strongest tournaments ever that uh, a woman player uh, played in so successfully. Uh, it was, I think, all the opponents around 2,700. And, uh, you know, some fierce tactical games, some positional games. You know, great fights. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, any comments or questions on YouTube later? Okay. Thanks very much. See you next week.